dear brothers and sisters, we welcome you to this Philippines area broadcast to all stake, district, ward, and branch councils. We, this broadcast is being transmitted via satellite to all stake and district centers in the Philippines. My name is Michael Jante of the Philippines Area Presidency, and I will be conducting this meeting. We also recognize the attendance of Elder Brent H. Nielsen and Elder Ian S. R. Dern, also of the Philippines Area Presidency. We also recognize the presence of Sister Tay, Sister Nielsen, and Sister R. Dern with us today. We thank President David Alicando of the Makati Philippines East Stake for hosting this broadcast tonight. Um, our chorister for this evening is Sister Cori Bacchus, and our pianist is Sister Lori Beth Lim. We will open this meeting by singing hymn number 243, Let Us All Press On, and following the singing, Brother Light Gaviola will offer the invocation. Father in heaven, we thank thee for the presence of our area presidency today. We thank thee that uh, we have this opportunity to hear inspired message and instructions from them. And we ask thee, Father, that thou may bless us with the spirit, that we may understand and ponder the message that will be shared to us that we may be able to open our hearts and our minds and in tune ourselves with the goals of our area. And please bless us that we may always have the spirit to be with us in the things that we do in our lives. And this is our humble prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Brothers and sisters, what a thrill it is to, for us to be with you tonight. It is exciting to think that all of the stake and district and ward and branch councils will be receiving the same message. It is our hope that this will allow us to work together as one. Most of us 
are still experiencing. We had a marvelous experience we had in celebrating our Jubilee year. It was truly a grand experience. As we reviewed the phenomenal membership growth of the church in this land, we learned that ours was the fastest one experienced by any area during its first 50 years anywhere in the church. We are now 659,000 strong. It is now time to leave the first 50 years behind and set our course for the next 50. Grand as it was, I would like to repeat what I said in my remarks during the area conference more than eight months ago. We have not seen anything yet, and the best is yet to come. What we have seen is a pattern for things yet to come. Most of you are familiar with the Filipino saying, Ningas Kugun. As you know, Kugun is a tall grass that burns easily when dry. When exposed to open flame, it quickly catches fire. It burns intensely, but is consumed in a matter of seconds. After that, the fire is extinguished and all that's left are ashes. That is why this saying has a negative connotation. It is often applied to someone who gets very excited about a project or an undertaking at the start, but often does not see it through to the end. Well, that attitude will never sit well with the Lord's admonition for us to endure to the end. According to President Monson, the Lord has always called for finishers and not starters. The Jubilee year celebration was intended to be more lasting than the burning of Kugun grass. In fact, we had hope that it will be a catalyst for more and better things to come. Now that we have seen what we are capable of achieving together, it should propel us into the future. It is our intention to share with you a better way of facing that future. Tonight, we would like to share our vision as an area presidency as we all work together to establish the church. In addition to your eyes and ears, we ask that you open your minds and your hearts. We are confident that the Holy Ghost will speak to us tonight as individuals and as councils. And I pray for these blessings in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. It will now be our privilege to hear from Elder Ian S. R. Dern, and following his remarks, we will hear from Elder Brent, Brent H. Nielsen. Brothers and sisters, as we've heard from President Tay, there's certainly been a lot that has accomplished in the Philippines in the last 50 years. The Philippines is the fourth in the world for the number of members living in the church in the country. We follow the United States, Mexico, and Brazil. Tagalog is now the seventh most common language in the church. My purpose is today is to give somewhat of a state of the nation address, except in this case it will be a state of the church in the Philippines address. I will show you where we are in terms of some of our key indicators, such as sacrament attendance and the number of missionaries that we have serving in the field. Some of what you will see tonight is not very encouraging, but we show it to you so that you can respond to what you see. There is little motivation to fix something if you don't know that it's broken and in need of repair. Our rapid growth in the Philippines as good as it has been, has actually created some serious challenges for us. The analogy of the olive tree, as explained in the fifth chapter of Jacob, 
can help us better understand some of the challenges that we have. The Lord of the vineyard was saddened that he had such difficulty in getting the olive trees, which in this example represent the members of the church, to flourish. Although he worked hard by digging and pruning almost all the day long, the trees would not bring forth the fruit that he had hoped for. It was the servant who recognized the problem in the vineyard with the olive trees. And the problem is not unlike the problem we have here in the Philippines, in our own little vineyard. The servant noted, have not the branches, the branches represent the members, thereof overcome the roots? The roots represent the scriptures and the doctrine that's found in the scriptures. A tree with shallow roots often has a very narrow trunk, which in this example represents the active priesthood bearers needed to look after the branches who are the members. Living in the Philippines, you know better than most that the trees with the most branches and leaves have the greatest difficulty withstanding the winds of the typhoons. Their survival depends on a deep root system. In most stakes, our root system of those well versed in reading the scriptures and understanding the doctrine has not been able to keep pace with the number of members that have come into the church. Added to this has been our narrow active priesthood base and therefore when the winds of opposition have blown we have lost too many members. We're certainly grateful for the work our priesthood and auxiliary leaders are doing, but in so many cases, they're simply overwhelmed by the number of members they are to minister to. Or, in terms of the analogy, they have been overwhelmed by the number of branches and leaves on the tree. We can be disappointed by what we'll see tonight, but we cannot be discouraged. No, not at all. For discouragement is a tool of the devil. We simply ask you to look, evaluate, and then determine to bring about any needed change in your family, your branch, your district, your ward, or your stake. Tonight, brothers and sisters, this night, we put a stick in the ground and say, enough is enough. Tonight, we say, we'll not lose any more. And we will bring back thousands upon thousands of those who have been lost and have their lives blessed through the ordinances of the gospel of Jesus Christ. As we look at the graphs, please remember that each number has an accompanying face. A Filipino one. One with a smile, one that we've come to love. When scripture talks of people being numbered, you can be assured that each number carries a name beside it, for we follow the mandate found in Moroni that those baptized, quote, were numbered among the people 
of the Church of Christ and their names were taken. The graphs represent you. They represent your family. And sadly, they represent your former friends and acquaintances who are no longer participating members of the church. Strengthening families is a priority for the church. Attendance at a weekly sacrament meeting strengthens families. You know that. The first graph shows the weekly attendance of members at a sacrament meeting. As you can see from this graph, the number of members attending sacrament meeting is low and has remained at this low level over the last five years. Just 114,000 members, or 22% of our members, are attending the most important weekly meeting in the church, sacrament meeting. Those who are no longer attending are depriving themselves of the blessing of renewing their baptismal covenants and the associated blessings. Yes, we are, we are pleased indeed with the 114,000 who are attending. And you are counted amongst that number. We thank you for that. Well done. You've been true to your covenants. Our total membership, as President Tay indicated, is 659,000. What we're not so pleased about is that there are some 545,000 who are no longer attending church. To help correct this, we have invited the full-time missionaries to become part of an army of reactivation. Much of their time will be spent in contacting the less active in an effort to reclaim them. The reclaiming of souls, or of the rescuing of souls, is not new to the Church of God. In the Book of Mormon alone, there are six references to reclaiming the less active. Alma, the son of Alma, headed a mission to reclaim the apostate Zoramites. And in Jacob, we read that many means were devised to reclaim and restore the Lamanites to the knowledge of the truth. Our army of full-time missionaries will assist the stakes and wards, districts and branches, in the work of the rescue. For part of their call is to establish the church. Now having said that, brothers and sisters, we remind one and all that each of us has a responsibility to reach out to rescue. This is the call of our prophet, President Monson. Let us go to the rescue. The next graph shows the number of converts over the last five years. On average, there are about 15,000 converts each year which makes the Philippines one of the highest baptizing areas in the world. Over the last five years, we've had over 76,000 baptisms. It's exciting to bring so many people into the church, and we thank each of you who've played a role in that. The next graph shows what our sacrament attendance would have been if we had retained our new converts over a five-year period. We seem to be reasonable at short-term retention of new converts, but we're not so good at long-term retention. The red bars 
show the actual attendance at sacrament meetings. And the blue bars, they show what the attendance would have been if the new converts had continued to attend their church meetings. Our concern is the increasing gap over the last five years between the actual attendance in red and what it should have been with the addition of new converts as shown in blue. You can see that the gap between the two is getting wider each year. We know that as members attend an uplifting and well-organized sacrament service, which starts on time, where the speakers are well prepared, where the hymns of Zion are sung with fervor, and where the sacred emblems of the sacrament are reverently passed by the Aaronic priesthood, that lives will be blessed. We must bring back those who are missing out on the blessings of this most important Sunday meeting. And it is equally important that each returning member is made to feel welcome, is nourished by the word of God and the goodness of the saints, and has a true friend. As we do this, we will surely do better than increasing our sacrament attendance by an average of just 2.5 people each year in each ward. When with baptisms alone, the number should have increased by an average of 13 members. To have the less active return is just part of our journey. Our endeavor is to have every eligible and returning member receive and keep current a temple recommend. The graph here shows us the number of adults with a current temple recommend. These numbers represent just 58% of those who are endowed. And we must do better. For we are in a worse position today than we were five years ago. Sadly, just 12% of our adult members hold a temple recommend. A current temple recommend is a sign of commitment, brothers and sisters, to sacred covenants. And without it, our personal progress is hampered. We join with the Lord in wanting each adult member to hold a current temple recommend, regardless of where they might live in the Philippines. To increase the number of temple recommend holders, we invite you to first look at yourself and then at your family. Does each member of your family hold a current temple recommend? And if not, what are you going to do about it? Our eternal happiness depends on us making and keeping sacred covenants, including those which are made in the temple. The success of our tomorrow depends to a large degree on what has become known as the rising generation. There are three Book of Mormon references to this group, and each is a call for them to be strong in their faith in Christ. Many, according to the Book of Mormon accounts, had lost their way, and therefore were called to repent and return. A similar call is being made today 
for the rising generation to rise up and be counted as spiritual sons and daughters of a loving Heavenly Father. This graph shows the attendance of our young single adults. With this data as a measuring stick of our young single adults, that rising generation, we clearly have much to be concerned about. Our concern is accentuated when we, we, when we reflect on how much of the leadership of tomorrow's families will rest on their shoulders. Their inactivity would likely lead to the inactivity of their yet unborn children and a subsequent break in the chain that unites families for eternity. We also recognize that the greater the activity in the church of our young single adults, the greater the number of missionaries we will have serving from the Philippines. This magnificent country is the cradle of Christianity in Asia, and surely you have a role in taking the gospel to other Asian countries. The day will come when much of Asia is taught the gospel by Filipino missionaries, and we must prepare, brothers and sisters, for that day. There is no lowering of the standard to serve. This is a call for an increase of full-time missionaries to be better prepared to serve as missionaries of the true and living gospel of Christ. The following graph shows how many young men accepted calls each year to serve missions. The number represents about 4% of those who should be serving. Many of you have sons and daughters in the mission field. And we pause to thank you for raising up children who have responded to the call. Yet while many have responded, we know that too many have not. And so increasing the number of full-time missionaries will be a focus of the Philippines area. In so doing, those who respond to the invitation to serve will be blessed with an increase of faith in Jesus Christ and return better equipped to live in this world. You will recall that President Monson has reminded every worthy young man of their obligation to serve an honorable full-time mission. And he has invited those sisters that would like to serve to join the church missionary force. As you can see, last year we had just 670 young, one young men called to serve. And we know that we can do much better than that. Gusto kong matulungan yung mga tao dito sa mundong ito. Um, alam ko po yung naging purpose ko at gusto kong ipadama po sa kanila ang pagmamahal ng ating Ama sa Langit. What really made me decide to serve a mission is um, actually the 
blessings that I have received when I finally realized how the atonement of Christ worked for me. I wanted to share that blessings to those that I'm going to teach. That's why um, I have decided to go on a mission. I love the Lord. One way of showing my love for Him is to serve on a mission. me in reaching this decision to go on a mission um, include the includes the missionaries that have taught me about the gospel and uh, also the state presidency and uh, the bishop in our ward as well as my mother who influenced me in reaching um, Reaching that decision to serve a mission is um, my, my parents um, and one of the, the, the leaders who influenced me in serving the mission is, was um, Elder Holland and um, when, when we, he was in a far side um, last, last October, um, it was a meet, the, meet with the prospective um, missionaries. Um, I was there and, and he, he encourages us, no? he strongly encourages us to, to go and do. And he said that, um, don't hesitate um, yourself to go on a mission. Um, don't hes hesitate yourself and put a question mark on it while the Lord is um, putting an exclamation point on it. bagay na ginawa ko upang maging uh, prepared sa misyong ito ay binasa ko po yung Book of Mormon cover to cover and nakikipag-work ako sa mga missionaries attend institute and ginagawa ko yung tungkulin ko sa simbahan The things that I, that I prepared um, before I go on a mission was um, First, as a young man, I, I, I achieved my duty to God. And second one is I, I graduated in a seminary. I attended institutes. Um, um, I, I magnify my calling as an executive secretary and as, as a young man counselor. And those preparations uh, really helped me right now in, in my mission. The things that I did to prepare myself to serve a mission is that I'm still like four years in the church now and was converted just 2007. And the things I have prepared since I was converted, I was already an adult. The things that I've prepared would include my attending institute classes and I have searched the scripture, especially the Book of Mormon. I speak of missionary work. First two young men of the Aaronic Priesthood, and two young men who are becoming elders, I repeat what prophets have long taught, that every worthy, able young man should prepare to serve a mission. Young men, I admonish you to prepare for service as a missionary. Keep yourselves clean and pure and worthy to represent the Lord. Maintain your health and strength. Study the scriptures. Where such is available, participate in seminary or institute. Familiarize yourself with a missionary handbook. Preach my gospel. Missionary service is a priesthood, duty, an obligation the Lord expects of us who've been given so very much. A fifth area of concern for the area presidency 
is the number of Melchizedek priesthood holders who are not attending any church meetings. The priesthood bearers are the roots we previously spoke of, and without them we cannot fully establish the church as God would have us do. Experience has taught that a branch or ward will rise in strength according to the number of righteous Melchizedek priesthood leaders that are willing to serve. This graph shows the number of Melchizedek priesthood holders attending church as a percentage of those who could attend. The blue bar represents those who could attend and the red those who actually attend. We acknowledge and reaffirm the need for stronger priesthood quorums so that families and individuals can be strengthened and so that the church can be fully established. A man may choose to walk away from his quorum, but a quorum can never walk away from the man. As you have seen from our look back at where we have come from and where we are, there's much to do. Remember what has been achieved, for that gives an increase of hope for what more can be achieved. I, for one, am full of hope, for we have each of you to help us bring change to the Philippines. Let us all join hands to further establish the church in the Philippines. The journey will begin with faith in Jesus Christ and the vision that has unfolded and will continue to unfold. That vision will include a flourishing tree with deep roots and a strong trunk. Brothers and sisters, I have every confidence that we can bring the change that God would have us bring about. This is His work. We're in the Philippines. This is a great nation. We can do this. With God on our side, we have the majority to bring the change that's needed so that more can partake and participate in the ordinances of the gospel of Christ. I testify of these things to you and do so in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Brothers and sisters, this evening we are gathered in very unique circumstances. Everyone here is a leader. Each of you has been called by one having authority to, to a sacred and holy calling. We have become partners with God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ as we strive to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of His children. This is our vision, that is our goal, and that is our ultimate desire. Elder Ardern has just shared with us some of the challenges that we face in the Philippines. We would like to talk with you now about how we will accomplish the Lord's work here moving forward. None of these challenges are so great that we cannot overcome them as we work together, united under one vision. As we meet tonight, there may be some here who, just like the storybook character Alice in Wonderland, are not sure where you are going. You will remember that as Alice meets the Cheshire cat at a crossroads, Alice asks which way she should go. The cat responds by asking Alice, where do you want to get to? Alice tells the cat that she doesn't know. 
The famous reply from the, the cat is, if you don't know where you are going, then it doesn't really matter which way you go. In order for you and for me to be effective leaders, we must know where we are going. That must be firmly logged in our minds so that when hard questions arise, the answer is easy because we know exactly where we are going. Those who we esteem to be great leaders both in the church and in the world have developed a knowledge and a vision of where they are going. And then they have determined what they must do to get there. In Proverbs, in the Old Testament, we learn this very important lesson. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Notice the clear and distinct words of the Lord to all of us tonight who are leaders. If you and I don't have a vision, the people perish. What does that really mean that the people perish? Perhaps I can answer that question by sharing with you an experience that I had while serving as an Area 70 in Idaho. I was assigned to a stake conference. As I arrived at the stake, I found the stake presidency to be very engaged in the work of the Lord. They had a vision that they had obtained through hard, revelatory work. They knew where they were leading the stake. The auxiliary leaders had also adopted the vision, and as I arrived at the stake, I found a unity and oneness among the leaders. They met the definition of Zion that we find in Moses 7:18, And the Lord called his people Zion because they were of one heart and one mind. They had achieved what the Savior prayed for in John 17, 21, that they may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. What were the results that I observed in this stake? They were a temple-going people. I learned from the temple president who was there that weekend that this stake was at the temple more than most stakes in the temple district. They had many more young men on missions than any of the surrounding stakes. They had full tithe payers and their sacrament meeting attendance was above the area average. Their young men and young women were being sealed in the temple. I learned while I was there that every member of the stake had a poster with the vision of the stake presidency. They had four things that they were all working on together to achieve. Now this talk is not about posters, but my point is that everyone in the stake knew where they were going. Their leaders had a vision and they were united. But do you know what I observed that was the most remarkable thing about these people? They were very happy. Was everything perfect? No. But I can tell you that I left that stake with an indescribable spirit. I had been uplifted and encouraged by them. I understood the importance of church leaders establishing a vision and developing unity. Here is where the story gets really interesting. About three months later, I received an assignment to go to the adjoining stake. In Idaho, this means that it's just across the road. These two stakes were in the same neighborhood. The children from both stakes all went to the same schools. The members of both stakes shopped at the same grocery store. These stakes are right next to each other. I went to the second stake thinking that I would have the same experience that I had in the first. To my surprise, as I arrived, the stake presidency was struggling. They reported to me a decline in sacrament meeting attendance. They told me that they struggled to get their young men and young women to serve missions. Their members were not a temple attending people. I sat at the stake center with this presidency and I could literally see out the window the other stake where things were going so well. As we met and talked and tried to figure out what we could do, the Lord revealed to us what was missing. These stake leaders did not have a vision as to where they were leading their stake. They were not united because there was nothing uniting them. I learned firsthand in a very visual way where there is no vision, the people perish. What can we learn tonight from this experience? At stake and ward councils, we must establish a vision. We must meet and counsel together about the specific needs of our stake and ward. Instead of meeting together to calendar, 
the prophets and apostles are asking us to meet together to receive revelation so that we may know what the Lord would have us do so that the people do not perish. We must meet together to establish a vision. And once we see that vision, then we become united. Where can we go to begin this process of establishing a vision? The First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve have given us a pattern that we may use as we lead our stakes and wards. During the past two years, as apostles have come here to the Philippines area, they have focused on the parable of the pearl and the box. Let me repeat that parable so that we can all understand this important message. A merchant man seeking precious jewels found at last the perfect pearl. He had the finest craftsman carve a superb jewel box and line it with blue velvet. He put his pearl of great price on display so others could share his treasure. He watched as people came to see it. Soon he turned away in sorrow. It was the box they admired and not the pearl. As we establish a vision and seek for unity, we must focus on the pearl and not the box. In other words, we focus on ordinances, not activities. We focus on individuals, not programs. Where can we find the pearl? Those same apostles, as they have come to teach us, have asked us to review carefully the leadership training emphasis. This is found in Handbook 2, Section 3.4. It is here that we find the pattern for establishing our vision. The First Presidency and the Twelve have given us the roadmap. What are the pearls that will help us establish our vision here in the Philippines? As an area presidency, we have met with Elder Holland and Elder Cook of the Quorum of the Twelve, Elder Collister, our contact in the presidency of the Seventy, our Area Seventies, and our mission presidents. We have prayed and we have asked for direction from the Lord, and we would like to introduce to you now our area vision. As we do so, we would ask that you and your wards and branches, stakes and districts unite with us around these goals. Where there is no vision, the people perish. That, they, that we may be one as the Father and the Son are one. Let me share with you our vision for the Philippines moving forward. These, shown on the screen right now, are our area goals for 2012. Each ward, branch, stake, or district president here tonight will receive a copy of these goals for your office. We also will be giving all of you here a card with the goals so that you will all know what they are and we can work on them united together under one purpose. Our goals are as follows. Number one, feast upon the words of Christ. We feel strongly that in order for our members to receive revelation, in order for them to hear the voice of the Lord, they must find themselves in the scriptures. Notice that this is the center of our goals. We must feast upon the words of Christ, for the words of Christ will tell us all things what we should do. This year, we must, together, find ourselves in the scriptures, for it is the key to our members receiving revelation for themselves and their families. We must put the roots of the Philippine tree deep in the ground, as Elder Ardern has taught us. Number two, strengthen families. You will see that this year we want every family to hold family home evening, family prayer, and family scripture study. We are asking that every member obtain their own scriptures. Brothers and sisters, in the Philippines, they only cost 77 pesos. Every member, eight years of age and older, should have their own scriptures and then open them. The scriptures would be appropriate baptism, birthday, or Christmas presents. Our third goal as we strengthen families is for us to increase the number of temple recommend holders in our ward or branch. If our members have not yet been endowed in the temple this year, we must help them go. If they have been and don't have a recommend, we are asking you as a ward council to do all in your power to help them renew their recommend. We must invite them to come and be interviewed and allow them the blessings of a temple recommend in their lives. 
Our third goal is to establish the church. You can see that this goal is focused on increasing the number of active Melchizedek priesthood holders. In order for us to establish the church and strengthen the trunk of our tree that Elder Ardern showed us, we need many, many more Melchizedek priesthood holders. We will need your best efforts as ward and branch councils to identify those you can invite to build our priesthood base. In the Cabana Tuan stake, they understood the importance of getting back their Mel Melchizedek priesthood. The stake president actually called three brothers who had been less active to serve on the high council. Let's watch this video of their experience. Kasi nga nakagraduate ako ng college during, uh, sabi ko nga, during 2000. Uh, Nag-start na po ako naging inactive sa church kasi unang-una po. Uh, from Cabanaton to Quezon is napakalayo. Wala po kaming simbahan sa Quezon para umatend ako ng church service. So, magkasos naman po kung every Sunday or every activity sa church na pupunta ako ng Cabanaton para umatend ng mga activities or Sunday service. So, doon po nagsimula yung pagiging uh, inactive ko. Ang mga dahilan po kung bakit po ako nawala sa simbahan ay problema po sa aking pamilya at siguro po may pagkukulang din po ako sa aking sarili. Ang maaaring mga gawin ng especially kami ng mga leaders ng simbahan, is to identify yung mga person. Kailangan nila kaibigan sa simbahan. That's why kaya nga binigyan ko sila ng, namin sila ng calling sa stake. Kasi kami sa stake, uh, uh, ang, ang trato namin sa kanila, hindi lang uh, high counselor, kundi magkakapatid kami. Kaya mapapansin mo, nagbibiroan kami, nagkukwentuhan kami na para kami matagal na talaga magkakasama. In, pero kailan lang naman. Uh, kasi yun ang nabubuhay ng relationship and then uh, talagang ang malaking uh, responsibility talaga ng, ng ating mga leaders is yung home teaching and visiting teaching para sa kanila Napunta ko sa Kabanat ng Philippine Stake sa Port Ward. Hanggang sa nakilala ko po yung mga members doon, yung bishop, hanggang sa in-interview ako ng bishop, uh, pinigyan po niya ako ng uh, isang calling din. Naging ginawa po niya ako ng uh, second counselor ng uh, Sunday School. Malaki po na tulong sa akin pagbibigay ng responsibilidad sa akin ng simbahan dahil mas lalo po ako naging aktibo sa trabaho sa ating simbahan at hinikayat ko rin po ang aking pamilya para maging active din, active din po sila kagaya, kagaya ko. In order to strengthen the trunk of the Filipino tree, we need to do this in every stake. The most important meeting of the week is sacrament meeting, where we partake of the emblems of the sacrifice of the Savior and remember him. As Elder Ardern taught us, we are missing many of our members at sacrament meeting. We invite you to join with us as we increase our sacrament meeting attendance in the Philippines. Our fourth goal is to save the rising generation. President Irene of the First Presidency has taught us that we are only one generation away from the church going into extinction. What does that mean? It means that if we do not teach our children and get them on mission so they can learn the gospel and learn how to serve, we risk losing the church here in the Philippines in the future. Prior to his death in a meeting with the general authorities of the church, President Hinckley spoke about our need to save the rising generation. He asked those present how many had served in the Navy. 
He then said that there are, th are three words when spoken on a battleship that sends everyone to battle stations. Those words are all hands on deck. He then said, when it comes to our rising generation and the challenges they face, we need to go to battle stations. All hands on deck. Brethren and sister of, uh, sisters of the Philippines, leaders of the church here, when it comes to our rising generation, we need all hands on deck. Elder Ardern was very honest with us when he told us that we are doing very poorly in getting our young men on missions. In order to establish the church here in the Philippines, this means we must change. We also ask that you focus on our young single adults. They are our future mothers and fathers, Relief Society presidents and stake presidents. All hands on deck. Our final goal is to rescue the one. President Monson's direction to us is clear. We must rescue the less active. He has asked us this question, who will man the lifeboats? As an area presidency, we have responded that we will. Leaders of the church in the Philippines on this matter, the field is white, ready to harvest. We have over 530,000 less active members. I think that gives us enough to do. We will ask every member to rescue someone this year. We are talking to you personally. This year, in 2012, each of us will bring back a less active member. In addition, we are asking each ward and branch council to prayerfully select 15 less active families that you can work with together. If we were picking mangoes, the easiest ones to get are the low-hanging fruit. The ones up at the top that require a ladder are the hardest to get. We would ask you to select the low-hanging fruit as you meet as a council to rescue. These would be those who have been endowed or hold the Melchizedek priesthood who are not with us. Let's start with them. So what do we need you to do? Tonight you will receive a poster with these goals that we hope will hang in every ward, branch, stake and district office and foyer. We are asking you this next week to meet as a ward or branch council and set your goals. It's important for you to know that we do not want numbers. We want names. As Elder Ardern shared with us in Moroni and after they had been received unto baptism and were wrought upon and cleansed by the power of the Holy Ghost, they were numbered among the people of the Church of Christ and their names were taken that they might be remembered and nourished by the good word of God to keep them in the right way, to keep them continually watchful unto prayer, relying alone upon the merits of Christ, who is the author and the finisher of their faith. We are asking you to list the names of those who you will, number one, prepare to receive their recommend, number two, prepare to serve a full-time mission, Number three, young single adults who you can invite back. Number four, those who will receive the Melchizedek Priesthood. And number five, the names of the 15 members we will work together to rescue. By February 1st, we will ask each ward and branch council, council to report to your stake or district president the names of those members for each goal. For sacrament meeting, it will be a realistic number, but it will be based on the names of the individuals you, you will be focused on. We will ask the ward clerk and ward mission leader to keep track of these names on the new and returning member report form found on MLS. After you have held your meeting by February 15th, each stake and mission president will report the names for each ward and branch to the Area 70. By February 25th, the Area 70 will report to the Area Presidency. We will then go to work. We will do all we can to unitedly, brothers and sisters, together accomplish the vision for the Philippines. We would like to show you a demonstration of the council meeting we would like you to hold this week in your ward or branch. We hope that this will be helpful as you meet together this week.
brothers and sisters, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. We appreciate your presence in our Ward Council meeting. May we request Brother Araujo to offer the invocation? Amen. Thank you, Brother Araujo. Brother Byatt will now give you a copy of our calendar for the rest of the year. Please take time to review it. We do not wish today to devote our time discussing the activities. If you do not have questions, we will now proceed to the main focus of our meeting. The Philippines Area Presidency has identified their vision to establish the church they shared with us last week. Five goals which they would like us to consider today are peace upon the words of Christ by reading the scriptures, strengthen families, establish the church, save the rising generation, and rescue the one. Today, we would like to focus on our challenge to rescue the one by prayerfully considering 15 names of families or individuals who are less active that we could prepare for the missionaries to teach. Since the broadcast, share with me the names that the Lord has brought to your mind. We have a good sister in the ward who was baptized over 20 years ago, but has not been to church for, for many years. Um, I don't think she really understood the gospel when she was originally taught by the missionaries. But she's very friendly. I will talk to her this week and see if she would be willing to have the missionaries in her home. That is great, Sister Luana. Any other suggestions? We have a member of the quorum who mentioned that there is an inactive family who are interested to go back in the church. And we will contact Brother Christine to check where the family lives and if we can visit the family. We have a similar less active family in the Tansora where the young Manahan lives. She is one of our young women and she is very close with Christine Flores. Christine is very active in attending some of our mutual activities. We plan to visit their home together with other young women this coming Saturday. That young lady also has a brother. Perhaps we can work together to get them both back and be ready to be taught by the missionaries. These names have potential. These are the kind of individuals and families that we need to help strengthen our world. I'm surprised how easy it was to come up with 15 names. Brother Gunahero, please make sure that we have captured the suggestions in our minutes so that we can follow up in our next meeting on how we have done as we have gone to meet them. We will meet again in two weeks to check on our progress. Thank you, brothers and sisters, for participating in our Ward Council meeting today. We appreciate your suggestions. We know that through our united efforts, we will see our Ward strengthened as we reach out to those who aren't with us. Sister Erika Franca, could you please give the benediction? For your information, we have asked the full-time missionaries to find through the less active. Over the next several months, we are hoping to reteach the over 500,000 who are not with us. As we do that, you will see the church grow exponentially in the Philippines. Would you please cooperate with the full-time missionaries as they ask you for ward and branch lists to locate the less active? We need your very best effort. May I share with you the parable of the golf course? I received the assignment as an Area 70 to be in charge of the dedication, open house, and cultural event for the Twin Falls, Idaho Temple. The church had purchased a golf course, and that is where the temple was to be built. As we were waiting for construction to begin, I noticed on my way to work every day that the grass on the temple site was dying. Members of the community began to complain that the dead grass was becoming an eyesore. Every time I drove by, I would ask myself, when are they going to do something about this? One day, as I was sitting in my office at work, I received a phone call from Elder Groberg of the Presidency of the Seventy. He was my supervisor. He told me that he had received reports that the grass was dying on the temple site. 
I told him I knew that and that I saw it every day on my way to work. He said to me, you know about this? I said I did. He was surprised that I had not taken care of it. He asked me if I would take care of this so that he never had to hear about it again. I got water on the golf course the next day. Here's the important lesson I learned, brothers and sisters. They is us. You and I can never say again, I wonder when they are going to do something about this. When are they going to change the things in the Philippines? It is time for us as leaders in the Philippines to take care of these matters as we establish the church together. Remember, they is us. In our recent training by the Quorum of the Twelve and the Presidency of the Seventy at General Conference, our area presidency was asked this question. If not now, when? If not us, who? We would pass that question on to you. When will we change? If not now, when? If not, na if not us, who? Thank you for all that you do. Thank you for your wonderful service. We can and will accomplish the Lord's work in the Philippines. Together, united with one vision. Brothers and sisters, I know we can do this. I know that we can make wonderful changes in the church in the Philippines. But we have to do it together. And we have to know that they is us. And I share that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you very much, Elder Ardern and Elder Nielsen, for a very clear message and for sharing with us the vision of the area presidency. I would now like to take all of everything that we have heard and we have seen tonight and see if I can tie it together. Following my remarks, uh, we will close this meeting by singing hymn number 157, Thy spirit, Lord, has steered our souls, and the benediction will be offered by Sister Lailani Papa. Brothers and sisters, when our children were growing up, uh, we had an unusual tradition of drawing lines on one of the doorposts. Each of the lines was labeled with a date and the name of one of our three children. The lines were like growth rings. They were always excited to know how much they have grown, so the doorpost would be filled with lines. As parents, I guess we were also excited to know if their growth is equal to the food that they have been eating. We wanted our money's worth. Similarly, when we set out to change our course, or to accomplish better results, we need to sit down, set goals, and make a plan. As we then move forward, we periodically review the direction we're going and measure the improvement we are making. Doing so will allow us to make necessary course adjustments. Another important reason for measuring and reporting is summarized clearly by President Monson. And I quote, when performance is measured, performance improves. When performance is measured and reported, the rate of improvement accelerates, end of quote. As an area presidency, we intend to follow President Monson's counsel. As we embark on this journey into the next 50 years, as Elder Nielsen has said, we believe that it will increase our improvement exponentially. We ask that you report your progress each quarter. This is important so that as an area presidency, we can see how we are doing as one body. The real benefit, however, will be realized in your own presidencies, bishoprics, and councils. As you monitor progress, you will receive revelation regarding the next steps. We believe that measuring 
and reporting our principles of righteousness. And if we are diligent in this exercise, we will be entitled to receive help from heaven. Imagine a high jumper who wants to do the very best he can. His goal is to be able to clear the highest bar that he is capable of reaching. It would be very difficult for him to know if there is no actual tangible bar to be cleared. He cannot measure his progress, neither can he improve his performance. As leaders, the Lord has set us to become watchmen upon a tower. We read in Isaiah chapter 21, verse 6, For thus hath the Lord said unto me, Go set a watchman, let him declare what he seeth. We need to lead the way, warn others and take them with us, or God will hold us accountable. In another scripture, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth, and give them warning from me. When I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Yet if thou warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity. But thou hast delivered thy soul. Again, when a righteous man doth turn from his righteousness, and commit iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die, because thou hast not given him warning. He shall die in his sin, and his righteousness, which he hath done, shall not be remembered. But his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the righteous man, that the righteous sin not, and he doth not sin, he shall surely live, because he is warned, also thou hast delivered thy soul. As Elder Nielsen has said in a recent meeting, after the Quorum of the Twelve reminded us the seventies, us, that we are to build up the church, Elder Raspand gave this penetrating question, which Elder Nielsen has shared with you, which I now repeat, because I think it is of utmost significance to all of us. And the question is, if not now, when? If not us, who? And again, we pass that question on to you and pass that similar challenge to you tonight as we consider what needs to be done. Brothers and sisters, we need to build up the church. If not now, when? If not us, who? Elder Jeffrey R. Holland gave a similar challenge to a group of stake and district presidencies as he met with them in San Fernando La Union just three months ago. He said, brethren, take control of the kingdom. For the church to be built up, we must have real growth. Allow me to share with you some of the definitions of real growth that the brethren gave. One, real growth means that those who grow up in the church remain active and faithful, being endowed in the temple at maturity, with young men being ordained at appropriate ages and serving missions. Number two, real growth means that those who are converts to the church are retained, maturing spiritually through participation in the saving ordinances of the gospel and keeping the associated covenants culminating in the house of the Lord. Number three, real growth means retaining the spiritual change of heart Alma challenged his people to retain. And now behold, I say unto you, my brethren, if ye have experienced a change of heart and if ye have felt to sing the song of redeeming love, I would ask 
can you feel so now? And number four, real growth means to move toward fulfilling the vision and challenge that Zion must increase in beauty and in holiness, her borders must be enlarged, her stakes must be strengthened. Yea, verily I say unto you, Zion must arise and put on her beautiful garments. In summary, real growth means that we not only enlarge the borders of Zion, we also need to strengthen her stakes and to arise and to put on her beautiful garments. When Elder Nielsen and Elder Ardern arrived in the Philippines, one of the things they told me was that it was a blessing to have someone like me in the area presidency who is a local and who know the people. I think we all tend to agree that that is an advantage. As the days passed, however, the Lord taught me these very important lessons. Number one, what appears to be my strength as a local can also become my greatest weakness if I am not careful. Number two, my counselors come in with new eyes and will likely see things as they really are and not as what they appear to be. Number three, that there is great wisdom in our senior brethren moving the 70s around the world. I am used to doing things as I have seen them done over the last few years. It is easier to keep everything the way they are instead of changing, don't you agree? The temptation to stay inside my comfort zone is great, but if I give in, I will become insensitive to the promptings of the Spirit and become resistant to change under the premise that I know these people better than my counselors do. The reality is, if we want to get better results, we need to change the way some things are done. Benjamin Franklin defined insanity as, quote, doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results, end of quote. And so tonight, we end where we began. We have not seen anything yet, and the best is yet to come. But the Spirit whispers that I add an appendage to that statement. And here it is. But the best will not come unless we anticipate it, prepare for it, and make it happen by changing the way some things are done. Brothers and sisters, we do love you and have great respect for each of you. Every time Sister Day and I return from a state conference or a district conference with you, we are inspired and strengthened. We thank you for who you are and what you're willing to do for the church, to establish the church here in the Philippines. It is my prayer that as we do this together, we will find success. And I do believe that we will find success. So it is my hope that we will be able to catch the vision together of seeing a more strengthened Philippines, one that is experiencing real growth. And this is my prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
omnipotent Heavenly Father, at the close of this meeting, in our desire to constantly seek counsel from thine hand, we are grateful for the sweet spirit that has been with us tonight. We are grateful for the avenues that open to us as we listen to the messages to bring Zion amidst the Philippines, Makati Philippine stake. We are grateful, Father in heaven, for thine cold leaders and ask that we may be more diligent, more sincere, more caring in magnifying our respective callings, that we may be able to help build and be more engaged in building Zion in this part of thine vineyard. We ask, Father in heaven, that thou would bless us with thy spirit in our respective homes, wards, and stake. We live this place with the perfect knowledge of thine ever-protecting hand. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Master, amen. amen.